guest on the show today is a woman who had um, a childhood of two halves, one in plain sight, the other perhaps hidden from her view. Now, the one in plain sight was her teaching at school and belief in two favourite uncles, Albania's former leader Enver Hoxha and the other Joseph Stalin. Not real uncles, you understand, but two men to show respect and devotion to. But gradually, as she grew up, she realised that her parents were perhaps, after all, not the fans of Uncle Enver and the communist regime after all, and that perhaps everything she'd been taught at school was not quite as it had seemed. Well, Lea E.P. escaped the repression that dominated her childhood. She's now a professor in political theory at the London School of Economics and associate professor at the Australian National University as well. Her latest book, Free, has just been translated and released in French, and I got a copy of it uh, with me in fact here now as well and she joins uh, me now here on set thanks very much for coming in and talking to us um, I want to start off by talking about a great story in the book about when you ran across um, the Albanian capital Tirana to the uh, Palace of Culture you pressed your cheek didn't you against the thigh of a huge statue there and it was perhaps the first moment that you realized that everything you'd been told at school was not perhaps quite as it seemed yeah, it was an ordinary school day in my home city of Duros, which is on the Adriatic coast. And uh, I was coming back from school and I ended up in a protest and realized there were lots of people on the street. The protesters were called hooligans on Albanian television. And the idea that there could be a political protest was very alien to me as a child, because Albania was not the kind of country where you would have political protests, because there was no reason to complain about anything. It was the most perfect country in the world. It was the freest country in the world. And it's... Uh, as I was sheltering from the dogs and the police chasing the protesters, I was hiding behind this statue of Stalin, and at some point I raised my head and realized that the statue had been decapitated. And this was the first moment in which I thought, well, why would anyone want to decapitate Uncle Stalin? And why, what did the protester want? And why were they shouting freedom and, and democracy? And later that day, I also realized that my parents seemed a lot more excited than I was about the protest. I was just scared and worried and didn't understand what they were about, whereas there was a lot of enthusiasm in the household about uh, what was just happening. I mean, there must have been an incredible moment, though, mustn't it? Because almost everything that you'd been taught at school all of a sudden was, was perhaps not true or not as it seemed? Yes, it was really like having two languages. At one level, I was taught in school to love the party, love the state, love communism. And there were mysteries throughout my childhood of things that were at home not quite aligned to how they were presented in school. I was speaking French from a very early age, even though um, nobody in my family was French. And that's because I came from this aristocratic dissident family who was keeping French as a way of keeping their identity and speaking it to me, but without really telling me that they were dissidents because they were um, afraid of the repercussions on them. So it was a childhood made of two halves, one under the influence of the state and the school and the other one under the influence of the family, where they weren't being open about their dissidence or about their opposition, but were trying through the symbols and through language to convey messages that only afterwards, in retrospective, made sense and made me understand that they were not as aligned as I thought they were. So presumably your parents and, and many other families as well simply kept a cap on everything, didn't step out of line. You know, why did they feel that they had to do that and what might the repercussions have been if they had stepped out of line? Well, there were, uh, at points, um, I, I, there were mysteries around my household. For example, the fact that we didn't have a photo of Enver Hoxha like a lot of good Albanian communist families. And at one point I mentioned to neighbours that we, perhaps my parents didn't like uh, Uncle Enver. And that was a moment in which I remember from my childhood they froze because they uh, understood that if those neighbours had been informants or if they'd been talking about the fact that there was this dissident family that was bringing up this child to disobey the rules of the state, this would have, they would have lost their job at the very least, but they would have gone to prison and uh, they would have had a history that was similar to those of my grandfather, my ancestors, who had also been to prison without me knowing that. I mean, was it a deliberate, um, not attempt, but a deliberate... Uh, ploy by them, if you like, to hide you from that, to, to protect yourself as well, presumably. It was both the, a way to protect me, but I think also a way not to kill my ambitions. I was growing up as this perfect communist child who believed in the state and everything that was being conveyed through the state, and I felt that they thought that if they had broken this too early, that that would have killed my ambition overall, and that it would have demotivated me and uh, turned me into an all-round skeptic, which 
in some ways it did afterwards when the when they revealed the truth and you discover that suddenly everything that you believed about the world turns out to be a lie and that everything you'd been told about freedom is actually ideology it's really very hard afterwards to distinguish between freedom and ideology and to believe that then the next thing that you're told is freedom is in fact freedom and when you say reveal the truth, was that one moment when they sat you down and talked to you and explained it all, or was it a gradual process? It happened over the course of several weeks, but yes, it was given to me bit by bit, and then eventually I remember I was keeping a diary at the time in which I was writing in my diary, this used to be called this, but now I'm being told that it's this, and uh, there was an Albanian prime minister who was being accused of fascist collaborationism during the war, and I'd never known that he was my great-grandfather. And I remember when I was writing in the diary about this, I was writing that this person that I thought was completely unrelated turns out to be someone who is a member of the family, a very close member of the family. And it was like that. It was like learning a new language where all the concepts that you believed about reality up to that point turned out to be no longer the relevant language and there was new, they were being replaced by new concepts. And it obviously deeply affected you and, and led you to, to, to finish up doing what you're doing now. Yeah, I suppose I'm interested in philosophy and uh, and especially in the kind of difference between appearance and reality and the appearance and essence. And for me, it was a bit like a journey outside the kind of platonic cave where everything you believe you know about the world and about truth and about justice and freedom and all these big ideas that we were grown up to believe in turned out to be a disillusionment. But then everything that you were given after was also packaged with ideology and also came with certain formulae. And it was a constant effort to try and think critically about all the categories and the way in which they're presented to you. What will you find if you read the book then? I mean, is it is it about, um, you know, a narrative about your liberation from this oppression? But there's a lot of funny stories in it as well, isn't there? It's a coming of age story, both at the individual and at the collective level. It's about a little girl who tries to discover her identity and to understand the meaning of freedom as she navigates the transition. But it's also a coming of age story of a country that uh, d discovers that uh, the oppression of one system and then the uh, structural oppression of another system and also needs to navigate and to learn what freedom is and to practice critical thinking. So it's a combination of a personal history, a political history and then a philosophical reflection on the meaning of freedom, both personal and political. And presumably you still have a lot of family and friends who are still in Albania. I mean, is, is there been reaction to, to your book there? Yeah, it's been, uh, it's been, in general, it's a very interesting generational difference. So there's people in my generation who I call the ex-communist, ex-children scattered around Eastern Europe who really identify with the story because they also don't remember. They have this innocent childhoods lived without, protected from the truths that their family knew and who then had to live the transition into a different system with all the harshness that came with shock therapy and with all the neoliberal reforms and discovered that the trans transition was very hard on them and another generation who had all the expectations of freedom that they had cultivated under communism and then were putting all the burden on the new generation to try and make them realize their ideals and so in some ways it's also a story about the different perspectives of different generations in a country growing up in transition but which is also trying to talk about agency under oppressive circumstances where it's really important to understand that reality is not black and white, that even in the societies where we think are most oppressive, most totalitarian, people make decisions and uh, that's where the humour comes from and that's where the effort to recount the everyday life under such circumstances is uh, there. And just very briefly, I mean, you also sort of use the book in, in a way to, to take a little bit of a knock at the British system as well, don't you? You're an academic in the UK as well, talking about failing to change structures that prevent everyone from uh, flourishing can be oppressive as well. Yeah, I try to talk about the different ways in which freedom is hindered. There is a, in socialist Albania where there is a direct oppression of people by the party, by the state. It's a kind of vertical form of oppression. But I think in liberal capitalist societies there are also forms of oppression that are not as obvious to us because they're more structural. Nobody is responsible for them. Nobody wants them to happen. But there is a series of uh, consequences of unintended uh, interactions between individuals that then make it the case that some people are excluded from the public sphere, that some people have higher education opportunities than others, that some people have more political power, more political voice, that wealth conditions the way in which we are represented. And I try to talk about all these different aspects of unfreedom also in these other societies that we had been long dreaming to be part of to try and uh, understand that there is also there a question of the relationship between freedom and ideology.
Le AP, thanks very much for coming in and uh, talking to us on the programme today. The book Enfant Libre in French, it's called uh, Free in English as well. Thanks very much. Thank you for having me.